Hello, I am Seema and welcome to part 7 of the chapter Solutions. In the beginning of the chapter, when I told you the different kinds of solutions, I told you that in this chapter we are going to study only liquid solutions. So when I am going to teach you about solubility, I am going to be describing only the liquid solutions. Let us look at this word solubility, ability. The ability to dissolve is known as solubility, right? So what is solubility? It is the ability of the solute to dissolve in the solvent. But we have to give a very precise scientific definition of solubility. So we can describe solubility. The solubility of a substance is the maximum amount of that substance that can be dissolved in a specified amount of the solvent at a specified temperature. You know, whenever you do definitions, the language that is given in the book, it is best to memorize that language because every word in a definition has some significance and has an importance. And a definition, usually the way it is given in the textbook, is uh, in the minimum possible words, maximum information has been given to you. So I would always, I always do encourage children to memorize the definition. So what is solubility? The solubility of a substance is the maximum amount. It means you cannot dissolve anymore. It's the ability to dissolve. So how much, like what we say, let us say, what is the capacity of this classroom? So, uh, so how many students can I fit into this classroom? So I have, let us say, 20 seats. If I have 20 seats, the capacity of this classroom is 20. I can have only 20 students because I have only 20 seats. So you cannot add any more to it. So when we say it is the maximum amount beyond this, you cannot add any more solute to that solvent. So it is the maximum amount of the sol solute which can be dissolved in a specified amount of the solvent. Imagine, I have only 20 seats in this room and uh, therefore you, I can have only 20 students. If I had a larger hall and if the students weren't really, if the seats were uh, for every uh, cubic foot of increase in the size of the hall, that would automatically mean that there is one more seat. If the hall became larger and larger, then obviously I could fit in more students. So the amount of the solute that can be dissolved depends on how much of solvent is there. If you increase the amount of solvent itself, that is if I increase the space in which the solute may be present, automatically the solubility would be different. You would be able to add more solute. So when you talk of solubility, you have to specify both. That is the amount of solute, the maximum amount of solute which can be added to a specified amount of solvent. And since we are talking of liquid solutions, the solvent here is a liquid, so we should these many milliliters of the liquid or these many liters of the liquid. We have to specify the volume of the solvent in which the solute is being added. So in the specified amount of solvent at a specified temperature. Why do we talk of temperature? As I told you in the previous video, that when you increase the temperature of a substance, usually the uh, reactions that are taking place, they may be endothermic, they may be exothermic. So the increase of temperature or decrease of temperature may affect an endothermic or an exothermic process. Besides that, usually increase of temperature leads to an increase in volume. Therefore, uh, the dissolution would be different even due to that but mainly due to the endothermic that is the thermodynamic aspect of it becomes important and therefore it is it the solubility of a substance in a liquid also depends on the temperature so we are now going to study since we said i said that we'll be studying only the liquid solution so liquid is the solvent in a liquid you can dissolve a gas you can dissolve a solid or you can dissolve a liquid so we'll be studying these one by one in this video, I'm going to talk about the solubility of solid in a liquid. The solubility of a solid in a liquid. Let us study about this. Take an example. Sodium chloride, that is common salt, and sugar. If you add them to water, they happily dissolve in water. You've noticed you take a glass of water, add one spoon of sugar to it, dissolve it, it dissolves. If you take a spoonful of salt and you dissolve it in water, it dissolves. And you must also have noticed 
that um, when you're making tea or when you're adding these things on the stove when the water is hot and you add a teaspoon of salt or sugar to it you find that you don't even have to stir it it just dissolves on its own but if the water was kind of out of the fridge really cold and then you added a spoonful of sugar to it or salt to it, you would have to stir it a little longer which means the ability the solubility the ability to dissolve in the case of sugar and salt is more at a higher temperature and lesser at a lower temperature here the reason is that the kinetic energy of the molecules will be more due to greater temperature and it will be easier for them to disperse between the intermolecular spaces of the liquid so solubility of these substances will depend on temperature here purely because they would have the molecules would have more energy <coughs> excuse me now what is important to pay for attention on here is that sodium chloride and sugar they dissolve in water but if i take another solvent for example if i take so, uh, oil or I take benzene and I try to add sodium chloride and sugar to them I notice that they do not dissolve they settle down at the bottom now what could be the reason for that on the other hand if I took nephthalene and anthracene and I put them in water they would not dissolve but if I put them in benzene or oil they would dissolve what do I understand from these at a purely chemical basis if I understand these molecules we find that sodium chloride and sugar they are polar solutes and water is a polar solvent while benzene is non-polar in nature and nephthalene and anthracene are also non-polar in nature so what do i understand from this that if you have a polar solute it will dissolve in a polar solvent and if you have a non-polar solute like nephthalene and anthracene it will dissolve in a non-polar solvent let us imagine that you have uh, I take you to a, a let's say a concert and in the concert you have young crowd you have really old crowd you have little babies you have all kinds of age groups what would your natural attraction be towards would you go there you're young and you're chirpy and you're just in 11th and 12th and you go there to the concert and you decide okay let me go and sit with this 95 year old would you go and do that or would you go and uh, go to an infant who's still trying to walk would you like to spend time with him or would you like to go with kids your age who are just having fun who are dancing around they're having a wonderful time obviously you would like to go to people of your own age group so it is known that whatever is alike is attractive so like dissolves like so if you have a polar solute it will dissolve in a polar solvent but if you have a non-polar solute, the non-polar solute will dissolve in a non-polar solvent. So this is one thing that we notice about the solubility of solids. And, and it's not just solids in liquids. This is solubility in general. If you take even oil and water, both are liquids. But oil and water do not dissolve. Because oil is non-polar while water is polar. Right? So solubility of any substance, what does it sodium chloride sugar substances which are polar dissolve in polar solvents and solutes which are non-polar dissolve in non-polar solvents and therefore we use this term is often used that like dissolves like similar molecular natures they dissolve now when a solute is added to a solvent let us say you add a solute to a solvent i have a little bit of water let us say it is about 100 milliliters in a glass and i take a teaspoonful of coffee i could have taken sugar or salt but that those would have been transparent so i used coffee when you put coffee into this it starts dissolving do you notice the color of the water starts changing it is happening on its own right now do you see there's a lot of agitation in the in the glass and when i stir it the coffee starts dissolving and you get a nice it is soluble it takes a little time because it was granular instant coffee and then I get this solution you know honestly I have added coffee only for the color if it was a pure well dissolved solution it would have been transparent but I added the color just to for the dramatic effect this is actually a colloid I'm sure you've studied about it in your class 10 
because it's not transparent it is translucent now when you added the solute to the solvent what happened what are the steps that occur in the first step we notice that dissolution occurs the solute starts dissolving it starts dispersing in the intermolecular spaces between the liquid molecules and this process of the molecules dispersing and distributing themselves all over is known as dissolution so as a result of dissolution what happens you have the solid which you added in my case i added coffee which was uh, or sugar or salt that you added the, in, you will have the solid sugar or salt and when you start stirring it you find some of the molecules they start moving away so you have some of the uh, the solid that you added in the form of solid and some of it starts leaving the solid and entering the solution so the concentration of the sugar or salt that you added starts increasing slowly in the solution or in the solvent initially the solvent was clear it was pure water when you added a spoonful of sugar or salt as I did coffee for the color the initially all of it was pure but as you added the solute the solute started distributing itself and therefore the concentration of the solute in the solution starts increasing and it keeps on increasing and then what do you notice what happens after a little while as this happens the concentration initially is just increasing because there's enough space let us say that I open the door to the classroom and I start letting students come in. and as they come in I have only one student he has no one to collide with he just goes and he sits wherever he likes another one another one another one finally I find that out of all the 20 as they came they randomly sat now when one comes in he finds that the, his best friend is sitting with somebody else so he comes and he, there is a clash he comes and he tells him the a person sitting next to his friend that why don't you move to another seat because I'll get to sit with my friend so that is when collisions start occurring and we find that this one says oh no no I'm just going to sit here and he says oh, I'll sit with my friend please move so they have a little tug they collide with each other they, that one pushes the one away and the one that is pushed away says okay then I'm not I'm not coming to the class I'm leaving he leaves and he goes back to the solid and it goes and gets deposited again in the form of a solid I'm just trying to dramatize basically when the molecules start colliding with each other some of them they lose energy as a result of that collision and when they lose that energy though they go back in the solid state because for the solid to convert into the liquid state it gains energy but when they collide and they lose energy some of the solute particles go back and start getting solidified so we find that two opposing processes start taking place the, the solute is getting dissolved so dissolution is occurring at the same time crystallization has also started occurring and the rate of crystallization and dissolution they go on increasing until a point comes where both the dissolution and crystallization become equal both the rates become equal at that point an equilibrium is established and when chemical when this equilibrium is established now the concentration of the solute in the solution becomes constant and we have studied about equilibrium it is a dynamic state it appears as if everything is constant while that is the state in which maximum activity is taking place how that the maximum number of molecules are entering the solution in the form of uh, in by dissolving at the same time the same number of molecules is separating out from the solution and getting turning into solid again and crystallizing again so this is a very dynamic state and now if you keep adding more solute to it you realize it does not affect it doesn't affect the solution why because as you go on as you expect the concentrations to change the equilibrium has been established and therefore the concentration is not the concentration is al already fixed and no more solute can be added now because the molecules solute molecules would be so close that they would hit and the, that number would keep on crystallizing so the concentration becomes fixed so we say that an equilibrium is established and at this equilibrium we find that no more solution can be no more solute can be added therefore the solution becomes full or saturated the solution becomes saturated 
Now, when you the equilibrium is the reaction is that you add solute to solvent and it results in the formation of solution and the concentration of dissolved and undissolved solute at equilibrium becomes constant that is the state of equilibrium but also at this state the solution becomes saturated even if you keep adding more solute to it no more of it is going to remain is going to dissolve because already enough is being whatever is adding to the solution is being thrown out in the form of crystallization so such a solution would be called a saturated solution so what is a saturated solution a solution in which no more solute can be dissolved or that is where the solubility of that substance has reached its peak. That is also its point of solubility. So saturated solution is when no more solute dissolves and this happens at the equilibrium. What are the factors that affect the solubility of solids in liquids since we are talking of solids and liquids? There are two factors that affect solubility, temperature and pressure. So we are going to study both of these. For a solid in a liquid, how would it affect temperature? We have studied about uh, equilibrium and we've studied about Le Chatelier's principle. According to it, whenever there's a disturbance in the equilibrium, in any way, the equilibrium shifts in a direction so that it can undo the effect of that change. So if the forward reaction, let us say the formation of a solution is an endothermic or an exothermic process and since it's a it's an equilibrium therefore if the reaction is endothermic in the forward direction it will be exothermic in the backward direction right that is one thing if you increase the temperature if you increase the temperature now there is a reaction which is endothermic endothermic means it needs heat to be to carry out the reaction so any reaction which is endothermic will be helped by an increase of temperature because what does it need? It needs heat and what are you doing? You're providing heat by increasing the temperature. So whichever direction is endothermic, it will be helped by the increase of temperature. So how does temperature affect the solubility of substances? If at equilibrium, the reaction should follow the Le Chatelier principle. In a nearly saturated solution, now on both the sides we do not say it is absolutely saturated because both the processes are still going on. Therefore we will say it is a nearly saturated solution. Now in which direction? If the dissolution process is endothermic, then if you increase the temperature, if the dissolution process that is formation of solution towards this direction is endothermic, then an increase in temperature will help the increase of dissolution. So if delta H solution is greater than zero, then the solubility will increase with increase of temperature. But if the formation of solution is on the other hand an exothermic process, then increasing the temperature will not favor the reaction. And if you increase the temperature, it would decrease the solubility. And uh, or in other words, you will find that more of solute is being formed. And the next factor that affects solubility of a solid in a liquid would be pressure or rather so the other factor that affects solubility is pressure. But in the case of the dissolution of a solid in a liquid, both solids and liquids are incompressible by nature. You cannot compress them. Therefore, the presence of uh, the effect of pressure on both solids and liquids would be almost negligible. There would be no effect because neither do solids contract on uh, applying pressure nor do liquids do that because pressure, they already have fixed volumes. If you add pressure to it, it does not it does not affect them in any way. So there is no effect of, no significant effect of pressure on the solubility of solids in liquids. So with that, I'll finish today's video. If you found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends, and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.